Hello and welcome to this webinar around finish the attack, focusing on attacking set plays. I'm delighted to have with us Tom Curtis, national team coach uh, around the youth development phase. I'm Ben Futcher, an FA youth coach developer. Hello, everybody. So the outcomes we're looking to try and achieve uh, from this webinar is to present key insight from the game within set play frequency and efficiency. What do coaches need to consider when working with their players effectively? And how does this look with appropriate practice design? So we've just got a short video uh, to start off with, just to um, just to let you know exactly what we're kind of focusing on within the kind of presentation. Great, some fantastic examples, lots of variety, uh, and really kind of frames up our kind of discussion moving forward to time. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Stu. Um, yeah, I suppose when we were uh, thinking about delivering this presentation, we looked into um, some of the stats around uh, attacking and defending set plays. So um, I guess some of these some of these slides highlight the importance of um, the way that you deliver your set plays and how much work you spend on them. So um, in terms of the World Cup in Russia in 2000, 2018, 42% of all the goals scored in that competition were coming from set plays and that's including set, uh, including penalties. So, uh, you know, a really high proportion of, of goals scored coming from that, that, that set play situation. For England, for our teams, um, I don't know if you can remember back to 2018, seems a long time ago now, but nine out of 12 of our goals came from set plays, whether that's corners, penalties, wide free kicks. Again, I suppose that stat really highlights the importance of um, not only the work that you do on set plays, but some of the skills and the attributes that the players need um, in order to be um, effective from these, these sorts of situations. And those are some of the things we'll we'll think about and talk about during this presentation. Uh, in the Premier League, 2019-2020, uh, so that's last season, 22% of all goals came from set play situations. So 227 goals out of the more than 1,000 goals uh, scored in the Premier League came from 
came from set again came from set play situations so again i suppose that's got me thinking about some of the um again so what you know what are the skills and the attributes and the uh, the capabilities the players require in order to be effective both attacking and defending from set plays because it seems to be such a an important part of the game Yeah, and, and in terms of corners, I suppose we will focus a little bit more on corners than than anything else today. Um, but thirteen percent um, of, of of those goals, so thirteen percent of those goals in, in in the set plays came from corner situations. So, one hundred and thirty four goals out of what you know, again, more than a thousand goals are coming from 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 corners in, in the Premier League again. So, so how important are these things? How much time are we we spending on? Not only, I suppose the you know the the structure and the practice of the set plays themselves, but how how much time is are us as developers spending on developing the attributes for the players and the capabilities of the players um, that's going to enable them to be effective, I suppose, when they get to their that that to that th first team environment. Yeah. So uh, again, more more stats just to, to sort of frame what we're going to talk about. So on average, five corners a game in the Premier League. Um, it takes um, uh, three corners to get a shot. This is on average to you know in 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 to get a shot on target. So uh, you know if you if you can manage to get three corners in the game in a game, the stats will tell us that um, that that will lead to three shots or three attempts on goal. Uh, and and to get a goal in the Premier League, generally you need forty corners um, in order to get a goal. Hopefully, this is the last stat. So, so twenty nine percent of possession retained off 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 corners. So, again, something to think about. Um, you know, do, do we, you know, do we instinctively, I suppose, throw the ball into the box, and do we consider the fact that you know, often, you know, twenty nine, you know, often that, that, that possessions lost off 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 a corner. Um, I suppose it's interesting to think about. Certainly, in different contexts within the game, is it is it right to take a short corner? and keep possession or is it right to take a risk to throw the ball into the box to try and get a goal so again an interesting stat to think about yeah no no really good stats uh, throughout and i suppose it just connects back to you know making sense of it around your context or wherever you're working whether it's in a male or female game and this slide just to kind of illustrate how the um the importance is played on both but actually the importance is probably more shifted towards the female games, you get greater returns for um, for being good at them. So, you know, how does that place importance like your working week to try and place more emphasis on this? So the stats um, are showing, you know, five corners per game, you know, three shots per corner, and then, you know, corners um, to try and get a goal is 33. So, you know, the, the percentages come down quite vastly from the male game. So placing importance around set plays, uh, within the WSL uh, to try and get a greater return um, is, is really important. So I suppose the question is to the people watching around, you know, what, what, do, set plays for me, uh, what do set plays mean for you in your environment? So keep making notes throughout and keep asking yourself in questions. Cool. So uh, I guess, again, when, when I was thinking about... Um... Yeah, thinking about delivering this presentation, but also when I'm thinking about um, delivering the set plays portion of our program and the youth development phase at England, these are some of the the, the, the considerations um, I suppose I might have and we might have as a group of coaches and developers when we're, we're thinking about this subject. So I don't know if you you want to sort of jump in on this, Fudge. Um, th th this is this is I suppose the, the the first the first question I suppose for us as developers. So what, you know, if, if set plays are that important in terms of winning games, so think back to those stats, nine out of 12 goals in the World Cup in 2018 for, for England came from set plays. We're going to need players with outstanding skills and attributes to be able to maximise those moments and opportunities. So I, I guess as a, as a start, a question um, and something for us all to start to think about, well, what, are, what are specifically the skills and attributes that players require to be successful at the highest level. Fudge, I don't know if you've got any... any yeah, I think it's a really good point. I think the kind of technical uh, delivery skills are key. So we think of set pieces and corners and we think of people maybe can head it. But when you look at that montage of, of goals, you know, it, people are scoring in different ways. It's not kind of the old-fashioned maybe delivery and, and head it. That's still there, but there's, a, there's many ways you can score. So I think that 
the delivery skills of players now. We've got such good technicians in the game at the top end. It's how we get continue to get these players through who, who can deliver different types of different types of cross or if you want to call it a pass at times now. I think that's that's key. And are we offering the, these players the opportunity to be able to practice it on a regular basis? So whereas you know it's not just lumped in the box, these are like it's it's an actual skill some of the, the delivery now. And it, it might be the difference at the top level between whether you get picked in a position or not over somebody else. If you've got that 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 ability to del- deliver a set piece inch perfect, it's a it's a key skill now. Yeah, I mean you look at you look at players like um Kevin De Bruyne, um the ability to hit certain areas in the box, whether that's um towards the near post, towards the back post, or you know, to be able to pick someone out on the on the edge of the box. He's got that technical ability to be able to yeah. Um, get the ball from the from the corner spot to a particular area in the box with, with with supreme accuracy and speed and spin to miss out to miss out op- opponents. So again, that that technical skill I think is really really important. What about um, things like um, I'm thinking I suppose about about brightness, um, about adaptability. So you know one of the things we'll talk about I suppose during this during this webinar is that you know every corner is similar. When we're delivering it, but but there the, the, the might be slightly different variations in terms of the positions of our um, our players, the positions of opponent, positions of um, goalkeeper, and also context changes, doesn't it? So you know that the delivery and the sorry, the way that you adapt as a player might be slightly different depending on the score, the weather, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think it depends what type of corners you're trying to kind of uh, introduce. Uh, Tom, because if you want a pullback, you might want a smaller player in the box with really good foot speed because mm-hmm. you think tr- traditional markers are often bigger players, maybe not that quick. Whereas now I think I think there's a role for kind of smaller, more technical players within mm-hmm. the, the within the penalty box on corners. If you're trying to work something, that extra foot speed and as you say, that sharpness and brightness, that's the difference between getting half a yard uh, away from your marker to kind of get that finish off. And as I said, look, when you look at the montage and look at where our goals are scored off corners now, a lot of it is is first contacts with your foot. It's kind of like pullbacks for strikes at goal rather than headers as well. And it's also second phase. So you want quick, bright players around the penalty area who can react to maybe the first knockdown on the second phase kind of ball. And that that's just as important as that first contact. Absolutely. And I guess that one of the one of the other things we, we, we can we can think about in terms of like skills and attributes for the players would be the, the, the way that they're able to connect with each other. So um, uh, the, the, the way that the receiver and the, the deliverer are able to time their delivery and movements to be able to connect at the right time. So again, I think that, 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 I guess it's a social, I, I don't know what it is. It is that, that, that sort of, um, that sort of aspect where I, I'm able to connect with you to be able to arrive at the right time and you're able to deliver the ball at, at the right time. I think again, it's a real key attribute for, for, for the, for the players in the, in, in the group. Yeah, I agree. I think timing for any set piece, especially when you're working on a particular movement, I think timing with between the deliverer and maybe the kind of, whether it's a blocker or a first contactor, it, it is key and it's vital. And again, you can get that by practice, but sometimes just by repetition, and it doesn't always have to be kind of structured. It can be relationship between two players. Sometimes we see players just have a great connection and that timing comes a bit more natural than with others. But giving them players, I keep saying it, younger players opportunity to maybe practice being inventive um, and really experiment with things. I, I think that's a really poor, important part of like set piece development. Absolutely. So, so the, the second thing I suppose, um, or one of the other considerations that I'm thinking about um, when we're when I'm delivering or we're delivering um, this this set plays portion of the game is, it, you know, how how are we going to attack and defend from from set pieces? So um, you you alluded to 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 their uh, foot. I suppose that would depend on the sorts of players you've got in your team. Would you want to expand on that one? Yeah, I think. For me, when you're looking at set pieces, you're looking at, at your own players, what, what have you got in your team, what are their strengths? Mm. And, you, and then you kind of almost, if you go to a more senior level as well, and you're looking at what the opposition weakness is, if you know who you're playing against, where's an area of the box that you could exploit with your with your players and kind of really try and get after their weaknesses? And I think that's important. Um, but one of the, the kind of big things is, is it might be short corners, TC. Mm. If you've got small players and, and quick players, you might be using corners to create... Um, two v ones out wide, then yeah. kind of work the ball on a different angle into different areas to kind of create opportunities to score that suit your players. 
I yeah, mean, if, if I guess, you, sorry, go on. Sorry, Fudge. I, I guess, like, um, you, you, you're dead right there. So the way that you attack and defend from set plays, I, I suppose coaches need to consider the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of the players in their group, but also the strengths and weaknesses in the team that they're, they're playing against. So the role of the coach there, I guess, would be to provide some sort of framework for the players to be, you know, to be able to execute. But also within that, you know, I alluded to before that, that, that you know, situations change, don't they? Situations change within the game. So we need to provide a framework as, as coaches, but we also need, I guess, to be able to um, develop players who are able to be able, who are able to adapt from that framework. Yeah, and I, th I think that's vital. I think the kind of context of the game, it changes all the time. So whether it's a, a, a set piece that's been worked on and players set it up, but the context of the game might change. Whereas you might have a really intelligent player who recognises a situation where they have got a 2v1 out wide. Yeah. And that kind of just almost having the freedom to kind of to get the hand on the ball and play and go and play and, and sensing that opportunity, really. So it's I think as coaches, we can give them a framework to work off. But giving players the freedom, because as well, some of these top players and, and play, young players, they're very inventive these days. And, you know, they've seen a lot of set pieces and giving them the ownership a little bit of, of kind of how they want to work it. I think if you can give that ownership, you certainly get a lot more buy-in and they want them to kind of, um, they kind of want to work them that little bit more. But but giving players freedom to kind of yeah. within a game for me is key. And it, again, that's where it comes down to to practice in a way a little bit without jumping on that. You know, it doesn't always have to be set pieces where it's going in the box. It might be hand on and play. It really a set play is a way of retaining possession as well as an, an attacking opportunity to score. Absolutely, it's a, it's a football decision, isn't it? So you yeah, know, I, I always I was. Give this example so if you've got a, a, a right back um going down the wing and he looks up and he sees he or she he or she sees five players in the box that are smaller than the five players marking them then they're probably not going to lump the ball in they're probably going to turn out and try and play their way in but yeah. sometimes when we get to a corner situation we're sort of instinctively um uh yeah it's an instinctive thing to to right it's a corner so i'm going to get the ball in there so I guess going back to the skills and attributes discussion, we want players to be adaptable. Um, and I suppose for us as coaches and certainly developers, we want to, um, we, we want players to make good football decisions. I, I, I suppose a good example, I don't know if you can remember the game against Barcelona, the Liverpool game against Barcelona, I'm not sure exactly yeah. what it was, but the Trent one where where he, he, he gets the ball put down on the, on the corner spot, I think by one of the ball boys. And then he, he whips the ball in for Origi when when the Barcelona defenders aren't 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 set, and that's a critical moment in the game where I suppose there is a framework there for 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 corners. So they would have had their routine, they would have had you know some some good ideas about how they're going to score from corners. But in that particular moment, he was able to adapt, and 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 he saw a particular uh, a situation where he thought, right, that's you know we've got a good chance of scoring here, so I'm going to make that decision. Yeah, that for, for me, that's good play is having the freedom to make instinctive decisions on what they see in the game. And I think that's so important. You kind of don't take that away from players as well as having a framework. Yeah. I mean, that, as you say, that kind of gets them through to the next round thing of the Champions League. Mm. Again, that wasn't any coach. That wasn't, you know, probably organised by any coach. That was just a, a player recognising a situation within the moment of a game, you know, and having the, knowing he's got the freedom to kind of go and deliver that and, and they, you know, and, and they score from it. So it's, it's vital for me to see that as well as having the structure, you need that freedom within players and, and players have got to feel that freedom as well. Cool. So we'll move on to the to, to the next one. Um, I suppose one of the things we're going to think about again to, today, and we'll, we'll 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 get into a bit more detail later on, is is well, what do our set play sessions look like at our clubs? So I mean, I, I played um, a long time ago now, but the, the the majority of my set play sessions or my experience of set plays was on a Friday after we'd done our um, prep for the game on Saturday. It would be okay, right? We're going to take five corners out on the left. Um, one of the um, reserve team players were going to take the corners if we were defending, and then the manager would say, "Right, you go and stand there. You go and stand there. You go and stand there. You go and stand there." So that's typically what our our set play sessions would look like, and I'm not sure that that would um, enable us to practice, um, I don't know, flexibility and adaptability and some of those skills and attributes that we just talked about. So I, I guess we need to consider exactly what the game looks like. And that should steer what our practice looks like. So if I'm a, a right back defending a corner, for instance, my actions might be in a game. I go from defending a 1v1 out wide 
the ball goes out for a corner. I've then got to recover into the box. I've got to probably, um, I've got to turn my body so I'm still seeing what's happening in the corner. Is it going to be a short corner? Is it going to be a right foot? Is it going to be a left foot of delivery? I've then got to turn around. I've got to see who's, you know, how the opposition team are attacking against me. How does that affect my position? What's the score line? How does that affect my position? How does that affect the, my, my, I suppose, my my game sense? These are these are skills and attributes that I need to develop as a as a fullback. And I guess what I'm saying with this this diagram is is do, do does our practice design align with the sorts of things that we want the players to be good at? Yeah, and, and for me, TC, they kind of need. I think players need a mix of a bit of everything. So if we have small sided games, or however you design, maybe a you know, a half pitch game. Do we have set pieces in it? Well, I, you know, I see a lot of games where it's there's no corners, no throw-ins, always start from the goalkeepers. Well, you know, you don't have to work on particular on any particular corner in that, but you get the players the opportunity to practice being inventive. So they get to the ball hand on and play. You know, are they recognizing actually we've got, you know, we have got two V one or or two big players against two players at the far post so, so they can actually deliver it. But but going back to it, I think in the senior game as well, I think there is a place where you need if you want to work on, we've seen the stats on set plays, how important they are. If you want to work on a specific routine, that does take time and real detail. Um, and there needs to be maybe a place where you put time aside to actually have walkthroughs and go through the detail of the movements and whether you're working blocks and things like that. So um, so I think there's a balance, especially in the youth development phase. Um, I think there needs to be a balance. And again, it's up to the coach's his, his judgment on where they on where set pieces sit with them and the importance within their phase and in their environment. Cool, good. And, and the last the last thing I wanted to uh, I suppose consider is you know how, how do we coach? So like you're saying there, is it is it instructive? Is it um, you know is it look you've got to be there and you've got to be there and do some walkthroughs? And absolutely, there's there's, there's 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 room for that, and I think that's a critical part of coaching. But also, I guess what I'd like to think about is, you know, how, you know, how much empowerment, how much um, ownership do we give the players when we think about these things? So, I, I, I mean, we've the last thing again with, within all that is 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 to consider what sorts of things make the players or the coach adjust the plan on match day. So we've already talked about, um, you know, the the, the score line. Um, the 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 context. So I often think as well, you know, in in, in a game, um, certainly in the you know towards the back end of the game, there's been there might have been so many changes. So the substitutes coming on and the players that were on the pitch coming off, and you often see um, the coach on the sideline with the with with his flip chart looking looking you know giving information to the players. And I know as a player, I I would certainly look through those those that organisation. I think I listen. I go onto the pitch thinking I'm not sure I, I know what I'm doing. Um, so I guess certainly from in an international context, when we're when we're in tournaments and there might be a high number of substitutions, um, we've got to find um, I suppose ways to get the substitutes to understand the changes. We've still got to be you know spot on in terms of attacking and defending set plays. But so what does that mean for the way we coach the players? So if if we give the players I suppose you know a, a, a framework and get them to understand their own roles and their own strengths and their own sort of weaknesses within that sort of set play situation. Hopefully that will give us a better chance to be successful. So this is just a, a, a quick example, I suppose, of that and a changing context. So this is the World Cup final. I think they're the under, the under 20s in 2017. So, that, so um, England are playing Venezuela in the final here. Um, and there is, you know, I think we're in the 93rd minute um, and we've got the goalkeeper coming up. You know, the goalkeeper comes up from set plays. I can guarantee um, on the wall in the change room, there was no situation where, you know, we we, we have, we, you know, again, for, for me, when I was playing, there was always sheets in the in the change room that would show me where I was and my organisation and the set plays, and that that's absolutely great. And like you said, there's there's room for that. But then the context changed in the game, and there, there was no... There was no sheet on the wall for in my change room that said, "Well, what happens if the goalkeeper comes up?" So, so the the goalkeeper comes up in this situation, and I, I'm not able to show you the film, but there was a really um, th th there's a point where people organise the markers, organise themselves. They decide that right, we're going to leave this the, one of the one of the, the what they consider to be the less dangerous players on the edge of the box and pick up the goalkeeper. Now, now is that something you can practice? Is that a particular situation you can practice or is adaptability and um, brightness in the players something that you can develop? Uh, yeah, so, you know, 
I'll just fast forward it through. You know, they defended the corner, they win the World Cup. I'm not saying it was because of that, but that's a critical moment in a game where the players are able to organise themselves and be um, be bright and be adaptable and, and sort of go off message in in a way. So there's a framework there for the for, for, for the group, but within that framework, it's really important that the players are able to be adaptable. So I ju just give you a bit of an example about how how we've started to think about doing that in the youth development phase at England. So what we try and do is is get the players to um, profile themselves. So we've you know I'm not saying this is right, but this is something that we've started to to think about. And this is this is from work from a guy called Richard Hartis, who's now working at Manchester United. He started all this 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 work off and getting the players to think about what their you know what their strengths are in terms of their their, their attributes defending and, and attacking offset plays so um you know one one of the roles that we've we've already spoken about um i suppose within defending set plays and attacking set plays is you know are you a first contactor so what does that look like what does it what's the detail beneath that so it might be a man marking role um it might be um you you have the capability to be able to win the ball and prevent an op you know opponent scoring um your job might be to prevent clear goal scoring attempts. Um, it might be it might be one v one, you know, on the ground as well as in the air. So you spoke about before, thoughts the importance of sort of second phase defending. So you might go from marking um, from an aerial ball to be marking, you know, on the floor second phase. Um, so this, these are some of the things we get the players to to think about how they. Um, we try and get the players to think about how good they are in each of these particular roles. So one of the other roles might be a zone, a zone player. So um, you're marking a particular space, but also ready to win the ball. So you, you know, you're, I always say a zone role is it's a starting position. It's not you're not moving once the ball's in the air or once the ball's on the ground. You're you know you're you're starting a particular position and then going to attack the ball if it comes into your area. Um, that might be another thing to think about. And then how important is this edge position? Again, you might be marking space, but you might be marking opponents. You might be occupying a particular area where you're anticipating the ball comes in. So again, some things to think about in terms of the detail underneath that that particular role within a team. And then the other thing that's, I guess, really important in uh, in defending set plays, um, uh, you know, is, is that up front position. So, I mean, again, in terms of how you're defending, you might have everybody back. You might have a, you know, you might leave one, two, three, or even four players up. I suppose you, we start to think about how the, the way the how, so the way we, um, the way we go about defending and attacking set plays has an influence on the sorts of things we want the players to be good at. So, if we want to leave three up, for instance, or or one up, the up front, the up fronter's role becomes really important in that he now has to or he or her has to secure possession when the ball comes out to them so you know if they're not good at securing possession when the ball comes out to them then they're going to concede second phase possession so again some 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 d some roles there for defending set plays and then some detail that sits beneath that um, and of course we do the same for the attacking set plays so very similar some first contact so, so first contact a role for, for attacking is you're now trying to score a goal. Um, you have to avoid blocks. You have to be combative. You have to be aggressive. So I don't know if you can see how these these roles are, I suppose, fit in with the skills and attributes we talked about at the beginning. Um, you have to be clever. So Fox in the Box have written down there. So how, how are, you, are you able to, to, to lose your marker? Are you able to be cunning and, and just run off the back of your marker? As soon as he turns his head to look at the ball, then are you going to be able to run across them? Again, some 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 detail that sits beneath that. Fortunately, you've already talked about that input. You know, the, the importance of, of of top class delivery. Um, I think about De Bruyne. I think about um, Trippier for the for the England teams. You know, they've got top class delivery. You, you know, that connection between you and the and the receiver is a really important one. Um, the the edge the edge player. So again. Um, really important as well in terms of I suppose attacking so if the ball drops out to the edge are you able to find a pass or a through ball or hit the target when we're attacking but also are, are you able to stop a counter-attack 
So if the ball drops to uh, your opponent on the edge of the box, are you able to make good decisions about, uh, I don't know, a counter press to, to, sustain, uh, to sustain possession? Or are you able to, you know, is, is it something that you've got to drop and, and, and recover into a defending area? And then the deep defender. So I, I do see a lot of teams now, um, especially when attacking teams bring all the players back. I saw Brentford the other day. Fortunately, if you've seen them this this, this year, so um, I think it was against Derby. So Derby brought all their players back, uh, and Brentford put all their players forward. Really interesting. Uh, really interesting. Uh, still there. I haven't, I haven't got it with me, but Derby brought all the players back to defend the corner. And um, Brentford were really aggressive. So, you know, they didn't have a deep defender on the halfway line. They went all the way in and tried to lock Derby into that area. So, I don't know what your thoughts are on that one. Yeah, do you know what? I, I think it is changing. I think with probably modern day defenders, they're, they're, all, they're very comfortable kind of defending halfway in the opposition's half. So, as you're saying there, you're probably looking at edge men. Now, if everyone's in the back defending, your edge man's probably your deep defender. Yeah. Almost like a dual role now. So, it's... It's kind of the ball pitched, and the goalkeeper role then becomes important because he may squeeze up towards the halfway line, and you can get an, an extra attacker in um, in the box, but yet you still kind of covered that space around the halfway line as we're talking about with the goalkeeper and and your edge man almost does a dual role. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So again, like what we'll try and get the players to think about when they're profiling themselves is you know what are you best at, um, so what is your your best position. But also, um, can you add another string to your bow? So how can you help your team? So if I am a, a really good uh, zone man, defending zone man, that's absolutely fine. But maybe to get myself in the team, I need to add another string to my bow. Because, you know, if we're saying that corners and, and, and so attacking and defending corners are that critical in terms of winning and losing games, then I need to be an expert. If I'm going to be a good player and get myself in the in the first team, I need to be outstanding and expert in some sort of capacity within set plays. And if I can only fit into one of those role profiles, then that limits my opportunity to get in the team. You know, I, I, you, you would have played in teams. I've certainly played in teams where the manager will look at the team and think, right, well, we're not good. We're not good enough on set plays. So I go out and someone else comes in. But I'll just jump in, TC. I think, I think players do need a function at set pieces, defending and attacking. And I think it's everyone's expected to have a role now. I think, you know, ex you know, I don't attack set pieces or defend set pieces. Again, that can have a real kind of impact on whether at senior level where a player gets in a team or not because there's roles that need filling, you know, and the more technical players you've got in the team, they still need a function and they still need a role. And I think it's important that we introduce players um, to different types of set plays um, throughout the youth development just so it's not a big shock when they do get to the PDP or senior level. Cool. Yeah, I think when we've looked at the stats, I think now... You, Within 2020, England have scored 31% 30, of their goals from set plays, you know, and that's a big stat. So that just shows, kind of reiterates what we spoke about, the importance of them. So now we're going to have a look what this looks like within a game. So we've spoke about a lot of detail. So now we're going to try and bring it to life with a couple of clips from recent England games on what it actually looks like. And then we'll try and unpack a couple of corners for you and just show you the detail that kind of goes into the planning. So on the first video, this is England against Ireland recently. We'll let it play at full speed. Okay, now now we'll go through it and it starts to break it down. And I want you to have a we look at the first one here. That's Grealish and Sancho. They work a block. And we've spoke about the importance of, of different players. And again, they look to get right across the front. The foot speed of Sancho is key. Grealish with his block. And he helps it on. And there's a chance at the far post. But again, Grealish and Sancho and the taker, the timing to get across the front is key. The decision whether to go for goal or help it on. But then Tyrone Mings there, and I think Calvert-Lewin, we're going to highlight, they spin around the back. They don't get drawn to the ball. And we'll talk about the second phase. You've got your big first contactors now arriving at the far post. And really, it's a great opportunity to score. You see Sancho, he gets right across the front. No one's expecting it. Helps it on, great decision, and then there's an opportunity to score. And from the clip there, you'll probably Tyrone Mings probably feels he potentially should score. But we'll go through it now. I'll stop it as we go. So that's the, in full speed. You probably don't. You see, you know, it's an opportunity. Maybe it doesn't look like a great corner. But now, when you kind of really go through it as we have done, you look here. 
Jack Grealish is looking. And the, I'll pause that. Now, if if Jack Grealish makes that too obvious, he's going to look to block Sancho's man. Then the then the defender has a chance to kind of almost miss the kind of block and, and, and get round it. So it's the timing, as we've spoke about, is key. And the delivery, Fudge. The delivery's yeah. It? So so really whipped. Whip delivery it has to be fast there, doesn't it? Have to be fast, has to be low. Timing, like you said, has to be right, so that Sancho can get the inside of his foot on and try and and try and miss the players because all the defenders have gathered on the near post there, haven't they? So they're trying to exploit a space on the far post. As you said, going back to the different types of delivery, that's that's meant to be low, and as you say, whipped in fast, TC, isn't it? So that for that first man, knowing Sancho's got the speed, Grealish has got the block, but. That's just highlighting, you know, your Grealishes and Sancho's, who are two of the most technical players probably in Europe at the minute. They've got major roles as first contactors and blockers, you know, on an attacking corner. Yeah. Help it on. It's definitely worked where the two big first contactors come around the back. And and again, there's an opportunity to score. You just watch, watch Mings here. He almost works away from the ball. The defender's ball watching. Calvert Lewin Arcs is run. They're trying to create 1v1s at the back for that second phase which they do well and be disappointed not to score for me there. Again, you know, great technical ability and decision-making. When to, do I go for goal or help it on? He helps it on and, and creates the opportunity. Okay, this next clip, again, it's England v Wales recently. We'll watch it at full speed, then we'll then we'll go back into it and have a look at it. Okay, so as we're watching it, the first man we've highlighted is Connor Cody. He really attacks, as if you're watching now, really attacks that front space, really kind of gets across the front man, draws him out. But then as the ball goes over his head, you'll notice he spins. And we've spoke about the second phase. Or it doesn't get it. But I think if, if things doesn't get there, I think Cody probably does. So as it develops, we're looking at the role again of Grealish, and this time it's Sacco. As they run in... Just watch them running there. We'll go through it. They've moved players. They've disorganised the opposition. And again, it allows the first contactors to come around the back. And as you can see there, TC, they've cleared that space to keep the ball alive. Yeah, ab absolutely. The other thing I notice on that is that is the, you know, I know we're not talking about defensive corners, but the, the way that um, Wales have marked... It's something I'm thinking about at the moment, especially with VAR, is, you know, has that rule changed? Has that, I suppose, different dimension to our game changed the way that we should be marking? So, you know, the, the, all the Wales players there have got really, really tight, haven't they, on the, on the England attackers. And they're all able to lose their markers. So gone are the days where you could, you know, you, the dark arts of maybe using your hand to pull somebody back or, or, or getting away with your arms. That's a penalty these days. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking certainly with the, the, the younger players is do we do we have to start think about teaching them to mark in a different sort of way? And as the clip runs on, we've spoke about Grealish moving players. He now he's got a second job that's almost to ring back round and give the security in any sort of knockdown around the penalty spot. So again, we'll go through it again. So there's a lot. There's a lot of a lot of real sort of um, detail that sits underneath that uh, foot, but again. There's, you know, there's responsibility there, isn't there? So, you know, the, the, you're talking about Grealish, Sancho, you know, guys, Sacco, the guys you think, you know, they're creative players. You know, are they are they that worried about things like set plays? But absolutely, if they're to get, if you know, if you're going to get in the team um, as a young player, then you need to have the mentality that this is a really important part of your uh, part of your game. And this is some of the things that we talk to young players about. You know, these are really important parts of your game and you can't just have one role. You need to be adaptable. You need to have more than one role. You need to be clever. You need to be bright. You need to practice these things. Yeah, it's a great point. As we play it again. Okay. Here we go. So watch it again at full speed and then we'll just talk through it again. It's, it should look at Ings as well. We talked about the second phase. He's not even looking to get involved and, and technically there... It's a brilliant finish. You need someone who can adapt, adjust, and have the technical ability to kind of react, and that's what he's done. So again, uh, you look at Cody. We spoke about. He probably knows he's he's almost a decoy run, and it looks like the timing. You kind of 
it's a great it's a great run across and he kind of spins round he when you on that clip there, I think you've got five Welsh players against three so they've as we get to the next point and we look at Grealish and Sacco it's it's they're not really looking for that first one look at the Sacco here he moves they're almost cre they're, they're creating the space for the first yeah. contact to have one v ones around the back they drag the players to the front front zone spin round for the second phase creating the space there for Mings to have a 1v1. And I think you look at the delivery on that ball, that's Phillips. Again, we spoke about flat whip delivery. That's just a driven ball with a bit of height on it. Really, and they've created a 1v1 for Mings and they've said, you've got a 1v1 as you spoke about TC and the advantage is now is with the attacker. Mm. And I think from this point, I don't think anyone knows of the coaching staff what's really going to happen. But from there, you've got decisions to make. Do you head for goal if you can and try and score? Or are you keeping the ball alive? Mings was great, keeps it alive. Then that's just the individual brilliance of, of a goal scorer who's looking for that second phase. Yeah. What's yeah. going on? The timing, the delivery has to be perfect, the timing of the runs. Mm. Um, then it's decision making of good players of where they head for goal. Look at Grealish, he's always looking for that second phase, it gives a bit of security. And, and then you get the brilliance of a goal scorer. And, and I suppose the last thing to say is that these aren't just. Set place, set play specific concepts are they for, for the players? You know, so in open play you've got to create space um, for your for your teammates. So running towards the ball to create space behind you, um, the timing between a passer and a receiver, yeah. the ability to I suppose latch on to a loose ball and anticipate where that loose ball is going to drop. So I think by often by by practicing set plays in this sort of way or or looking at you know the, the the detail I guess that sits behind the, this stuff. It, it's it's football, isn't it? It's it's a it, the football capabilities. They're not just set play capabilities. This is football stuff. Cool. Yeah. So so that so I guess we're coming to the end of the presentation now. Um, th th this is again some of the things that we do as coaches with the players, and the players do with 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 us as coaches. So what we try and do, we rag rate rag rate the players, or they rag rate themselves. In terms of those roles, so um, I might start to think about: Well, am I good at that near post zone zone sort of um, uh, position? How, how good am I there? If am I green? I'm, yeah, I'm good. I'm in the team. If I'm red, that might be something I need to to to, to work on to get better at. And I guess as well, you know, when when you're thinking about again, I alluded to this before. When you're thinking about um, managers in performance environments, this will steer selection. So if you've got, you know, if you've got players in your team with a lot of reds then then that that you know his alarm bells there if we, again if we're saying that that set plays are critical and a really important part of deciding whether or not we win or lose games then then these the, you know the players need to be good they need to be top at these these the, these things cool yeah so i just briefly uh, let you know about what this might look like in terms of practice design so I, I guess if we're going to develop um, that adaptability that we talked about, that brightness, um, that clever, that cunning sort of capability in the players, then certainly young, younger, you know, when they're younger and, and even when they're older, then we need to give the players ownership and responsibility. We need to be able to empower them to make those adaptable decisions. Certainly we need to... Um, as coaches give them some tools and provide some framework and you know look at in detail about the strengths and weaknesses of our players and also the strengths and weaknesses of the opposition i um, seen some unbelievable examples of you know like detail there i'm thinking those those corners that that we've just seen uh, england deliver a lot of work's gone in there with, with, with steve and gareth and the group and, and and the players so there's a lot of detail and a lot of work that goes into providing that that framework uh, my view is that there needs to be competition in practice so there needs to be consequence so if we're you know if we're having a, a a set play game where it doesn't really matter whether the ball goes in or it or it doesn't go in then there's not going to be you know and we're not placing value on that then are we losing that you know are we losing the sharpness of um, attacking set plays and adaptability are we losing that mentality to put a block in as a defender are we losing that mentality? We're not practicing that mentality to stay with your marker or lose your marker. So I think competition is a real important part of practice. 
uh, and as well as like you know instilling some belief into the players so so you're able to go and to to, to go and score you're able to um be creative you're able to you know to, to whip the ball in with quality so again some some considerations i guess from up for our practice design and i guess with england um it's really important that we utilize all these things so you know what i'm i'm thinking about with the with the young players in england is you know we, we've already said that set plays or or developing capabilities and attributes in the players um that's going to help them be outstanding at set plays is important how do we maximize our time time with the players how do we get them to be good at this sort of stuff how do we get them to be organized you know so if we're going into the european championships under 17s we need to be absolutely spot on but we've got lots of things to practice and we don't have them for that long so how you know these are the questions i'm always thinking about how can we maximize our time with the players how can we manage their physical load i think it's a critical one how, how can we make it interesting and enjoyable and in, i say enjoyable i suppose uh, with a proviso that it needs to be tough it needs to be competitive the challenge point needs to be absolutely right the players the top players need competition they need it to be hard it's not for it's not fun and games like it's in the playground it needs to be tough it needs to be challenging and that's enjoyable in a way i guess uh, i mean often how, how can we use the environment around us so if we're away from home we don't always have the use of a, a full-size pitch or an indoor astroturf we have to be adaptable as coaches and, and i've experienced that and i'm sure you have fortune Stu. um you know you, you don't always have perfect facilities but you have to come up with ideas about how you can help the players practice so we'll use things like mini pitch we'll use things like sabutio Obviously, we'll do some on-pitch practice. We'll use animations. We'll use videos um, to try and get our messages across to the players, but also to try and get the players to come up with creative ideas and and and, and get that element of adaptability. Yes, yeah, so this is a slide really emphasising uh, some of the key statistics around what might influence your practice design. So. You know, how did possession start within the WSL? So in the big kind of bold print, so it's 55% from transition, 26% uh, from throw-ins, 6% from free kicks and 13% from corners. And in brackets underneath, uh, they're the percentage from the uh, Premier League. So very similar, but certainly things to think about when designing practice and maybe starting positions. Yeah, I mean, that's a great one, Stu, isn't it? Um, so if we're saying 26% of possessions in the attacking third are coming from throw-ins, Again, I'm thinking, you know, how much time do we spend practicing it? So, um, you know, are, are the players expert throw-in takers? Are they um, experts at um, having really good connections between the thrower and the receiver? Is the timing always right? Um, is the structure always right? I mean, we, I often see games where the um, the thrower is not an expert. Throw, you know, there's, there's loads of foul foul throws, certainly in new football, and I often think, well. And the referee lets them lets it go, and I think, mm, okay, that that's that's great because we're getting lots of free play. But you know, are we are, are we are we placing enough value on that that that? Um, it's a skill. It's a football skill. It's not not important in football. If we're saying that, you know, if you look at Liverpool, uh, certainly last year, I think they scored a, a, you know a really high percentage of goals from their throw-ins. They had some um, really nice routines. I think they employed a throwing coach, and and a lot of the the top teams now are, are looking for that edge. Um, so is, you know, is throw-ins part of our our, our practice? Have we, are we developing expert throw-in takers at, at, at full-back in, in wide positions? So these are these are some of the, the games that, uh, you know, I, I've, I've thought about and had to go up practicing, delivering with, with the England youth teams, but also in, 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 in the club environment and also on the courses. And hopefully we'll get a chance with the, the guys that are watching this video to, to go through some of these these practices when they when they get a chance to come in St George's Park so they're basically small sided games Stu um, but like you said with certain starting positions so the top game there um, you know I generally start with a throw in from that game and it might be we have you know five throw ins for the I know that the whites there are taking a corner but you could have five throw ins down the, the left hand side and play to a finish so um, within that particular area of the pitch, the ball may go out for a corner. Um, it may end up with a free kick. Um, so it's a small side of the game, but with a particular starting position. Um, so the, 
right, Tom, is it? So when you think about uh, full-backs in, in open play, mm. if you gave the ball away maybe as many times as they maybe did when they're taking the throw in, maybe they won't be in the game, they won't yeah. be selected. I suppose when you start looking at the um, you know outside defenders now who might be sent your by by their experiences through the pathway and not an opportunity to maybe take throwing. So how that kind of informs what you might have to do with younger players as you start to progress through the age and stages to give them this experience. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So that practice at the top is again small side of game with a throw-in or a corner start in position. Dead simple. Um there's a goal on the side, so that I don't know if you can see the goal on the side next to the goal, uh, behind the goalkeeper. That's for the attacking team. So if you get a cross or if you can hit that goal from, from a cross, um, in, a re in a real game, in a bigger version of that game, you'd have um, uh, a, a seven coming in a far stick when you'd have, you'd have um, Sancho or Sterling coming in a far stick to score. So that's a good area to put the ball in. Um, and I guess what I try and do with this game is is get the players, and we'll do this when they, the lads come in on the lads and uh, girls come in on the course. We'll get them to um, develop some routines and think about what their routines and what their framework is based on their strengths and based on the strengths of the opposition. So we do have a framework. We do encourage people to to in this particular practice encourage people to have a particular framework, but also be be able to be adaptable with it within this competitive game and the game the game at the bottom is just a very similar one so again it's a small side of game but with some starting positions from free kicks so we've already said that the first contact is really really important from from a free kick but lots and lots of goals are scored off second phase so that might um it might be a first contact but a key attribute of an edge play an edge player might be to land on that second ball and then be able to exploit a, a, a 2v2 or a 2v1 or thread a ball in for a forward to score. Um, so what I'm trying to do, I guess, with these practices is, is yes, you set plays as a framework, but also think about what are the skills and attributes the players need to be good at in order to be outstanding at set plays. And that's not always just the first phase of, 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 uh, of possession. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the, the other thing, I know this look, this is a really, really simple one, but a small side of game or an 11 side game with, you know, and I know it sounds daft, but just just take the set plays. So if it goes out for a throw in, take a throw in. Um, if it goes out for a uh, a corner, take a corner. Um, we, we often see, don't we? Or you know, we've all done it ourselves, where we want lots of free play and we want the ball. So every time it goes out for a corner, we'll start from a goal kick. And I think, hey, you know, if if we're scoring a vast amount of goals from corners, why are we not practicing them? So your practice doesn't always have to be on a Friday. We'll do. X amount of corners from the left and the right, like I used to do. But let's try and, um, you know, let's let's just practice them. Let's let's use the rules. Let's just play football as you know we're we're supposed to play football and go go you know use it with the rules. This I guess the smaller size pitch there would encourage you know the ball's going to go out more, so you're probably going to get more set play actions. There might be you know players are going to be closer to each other. There's more opportunities, I guess. Opportunities probably the wrong word, but more. Um, instances where players foul each other so there might be more free kicks um we've i've put conditions on that sort of practice you'll see in that game two on the left so you know if the, if the team in possession can keep the ball for six passes on the sixth pass they're able to take a free kick so that that i guess that increases the amount of chances that both teams would get to practice attacking and defending free kicks but also it would encourage the attacking team to play the ball forward into dangerous areas. So, you know, if you have a free kick, you want it closer to the box, closer to the, their goal than your goal, don't you? So you try and thread the ball and play the ball forward so that on the sixth pass, you're able to take a free kick from closer to their goal. So I guess a number of different outcomes. And we'll also have in these games, you know, we'll have sendings off. So we'll have, you know, I often, you know, manipulate a little bit so maybe one or two players get get sent off and have a bit of a laugh and a joke with the players but from a, with a serious hat on the players are then going to have to be adaptable so if you're two players down against a team with with two players more what does that mean for the way that you defend well the rule book the rule book the framework might go not out the window but it might have to change in the way that you you defend it might have to change in terms of the way that you attack so what i guess we're encouraging there is again adaptability and that is important, TC, isn't it, for games? Because if something happens, 
in a game. Sometimes the coaches have not got time to kind of get information on. So players have got to make them decisions for themselves. Absolutely. Like, way of them practicing it because if, if they've never experienced it or had the opportunity to practice making them decisions as coaches how can we expect them to make them when it matters on a game day so it's yeah absolutely absolutely Fudge yeah 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 and th th this is just um, a, a practice I like I think this is this is Coops and the under 17s from a few years ago with with Rich behind the goal. So it's, it's again, it's a small side of game, but there's a number of techniques. So that's that zone man practicing his clearance there, um, the person um, delivering is practicing his delivery. The ball falls to the edge men. They're now practicing um, a two v two situation. Um, so so we've I think that these guys here have created a practice. It's a small sided. It's a competitive practice. And the players are going to, I, I guess, enjoy it. It's difficult, but it's replicating what happens in the game. Um, yeah. It, again, I'm, I'm probably teaching people or, or teaching people to how to suck eggs here. But you know, if we if we're delivering practice, we'd better make sure it looks like what happens or the skills and attributes the players need to be good at in order to execute successfully during the game. So a through ball there, see the edge man. Um, running through the defenders on the edge of, edge of the box, having to defend, defend the defend the space. This is what happens in the game. Yeah, we can go to the next slide now. Great stuff. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you, Futch, for the um, great discussion, sharing your expertise. Uh, these are the outcomes what we set out at the uh, beginning of the webinar. I think these have been covered in, in very great detail. Uh, so just want to uh, thank you both for um, for sharing your, your thoughts and expertise. And uh, thank you very much. Pleasure. Cheers, Stu. Cheers, Butch. Cheers, TC.